Hey guys, welcome to Telling the Told and Untold. My name is Zoro. This is part two of today's case. Part one was uploaded a couple of days ago, so if you haven't watched that video, I think you really should because it wouldn't make sense if you just start watching this one because there's so much that happens. I'll link it up here for you guys and also put it down in the description box so you can go watch that first before you watch this case. So before we go straight into today's case, I do want to give you guys a quick recap about what we spoke about in part one. If you don't want to watch the recap, I'll put a timestamp to where you can skip to so you can just go straight into today's case. So in part one, we spoke about Tandiwe Beti Kitani and how she grew up in Queenstown and then moved to Johannesburg. And then she started working at a restaurant called Cranks. And Cranks was owned by a man and his name was or is Eric and she worked there for almost 14 years until 1999 when Eric's daughter whose name is Monique started working at Cranks. She was like the new boss and she moved from abroad and as soon as Monique started working at Cranks things started changing. She started firing a lot of the staff and she also demoted Tandiwe who was head chef and she just became like a normal worker and that's because she didn't like the fact that Tandiwe had influence over the workers at Cranks and also because Eric kind of like sort of trusted her especially because she had been working at Cranks for almost 14 years. Also after Monique started working at Cranks things started happening. So Eric discovered that people or someone had been stealing checks from him and cashing them fraudulently and also someone had been stealing stock as well as cash. So he decided to ask Monique to look into it and this is when Monique hired a private investigation company to look into these thefts that were happening at Cranks. And the PI business was owned by a man and his name was Carrington Lofton. So Carrington's PI business started looking into the thefts that were happening at Cranks and this went on for a while and then it turned out that he wasn't investigating it like normal investigations would like happen. It turned out that they were kidnapping and assaulting ex-workers from Cranks and they had managed to kidnap two people and assault them and their names were Temba Shabalala as well as Ndaba Bebe and then someone else her name was Ruth Mobo. they had tried to kidnap her but community workers had managed to get her away from them and then she basically just went into hiding so all of that was happening and then Temba managed to open a case um, with the police so that they could look into what was happening and they linked all of those kidnappings and assaults to cranks and they found two key people but then when it was time for them to identify them in an uh identity parade the three witnesses just didn't want to deal with it so they basically just ran away and that was the end of the case so then a couple of years go by and now we're in 2004 and then there's another man his name is Conway Brown and Conway started working for Carrington and he did like small jobs for the PI business so Carrington was renting out a property from um, a family their names or they were the marshals and he lived on the property in like lived in the property and it was on the marshals property like you know they were just renting it out and they were also good friends and then in 2004 Conway started acting different he was really stressed he started losing weight he was drinking more than he usually did and then in the beginning of January 2005 in the beginning of January 2005 <laughs> um, when the year started in 2005 Conway and his wife just moved out they didn't let the marshals know and they didn't ask for their deposit back or their the rent that they had paid two months in advance they just kind of like disappeared and the marshals just didn't look into it and then a couple more years years would go by and now we're in 2012 Tandiwe is still missing and the marshals had new tenants living in the same property that Conway and his wife used to live in so they basically just kicked these tenants out because they weren't the greatest of tenants they weren't paying their rent so they finally got them to leave and they decided to clean up this property before their new tenants come and move in and they decided to pull up the carpets because the carpets had been there for like two decades 
and you know they were old they were smelly they wanted something new so as we were pulling up the carpets they found a stack of envelopes so on the stack of envelopes it was written to not throw away and there were several letters like in the stack one of the first papers had several names written on it as well as phone numbers and some of them had identity numbers and next to one name it simply said alive another letter basically just spoke about a robbery that had happened or was going to happen and it was addressed to conway's wife blanche and then they found a third letter and this one was typed out and it almost seemed like an affidavit and it was just written one of the first words written or like the first line it said sandal if you're reading this i am dead and that's where we ended part one so let's go straight into part two just like part one there aren't any content warnings yo that was a handful but part two gets more interesting so we left off with the first line of the typed out letter that said dear sandal if you're reading this i am dead so the first paragraph would go on to speak about a kidnapping and assault that had happened to a man named temba shabalala and basically in this first paragraph the person said that and i quote me dirk monique and mark based that they did the kidnapping and assault into temba shabalala and that how temba had opened a case and they talked about the police officer who was investigating the kidnapping and then also said that the officer would be interested in knowing that monique carl and andre all knew each other the rest of the letter also described an attack into someone who his name was Ndaba Bebe and then they also spoke about where they could find uh, sex tapes and photos that Monique had and then this writer also said that Monique had lied to her father Eric about killing someone named Ruth Ngobo and how Ruth was actually alive and Monique had just lied. The letter really didn't mean much to the marshals because they didn't know anyone that this writer was talking about until they got to the second paragraph and they saw a name that they knew all too well. So in the second paragraph, the writer basically spoke about how they had killed someone whose name was Betty Kitani. They said that they kidnapped her and then they had left her for dead on the side of the road and then she had been picked up by a passerby and taken to the hospital. Whilst this Betty was in the hospital, one of the nurses called Monique to let her know that her worker was there and then this writer dressed up as a nurse with a group of other men and then they went to the hospital and abducted Betty. They then took her to a farm in Clip River and this was the same farm where they had taken Temba Shabalala and Ndaba Bebe and where they had assaulted them. So once they got to the farm they put Betty in a bus that was it was like an abandoned bus so they just put her in the bus and then they left and then the next morning when they returned she was dead then the letter spoke about how conway brown and other people had buried betty on the property that conway lived on and had just left her there and then that was the end of the letter and the marshals were immediately like they were like shocked they were scared they couldn't believe it because the name that they recognized was conway brown because obviously conway had lived on their property so now they thought that there was a body on their property also the typed out letter didn't have any name written like who had written it there was just a signature at the bottom of each page but like no name the marshals didn't think that conway was capable of murder and they knew that they couldn't do nothing about the letters but they didn't want to go to the police because they thought that if the police did find a body on their property then they might like link them to the body and then they would pay like the repercussions of what conway had done so knowing that maybe conway had something to do with the murder and there were like murderers out there as well as a body on their property and a family that didn't know what happened to their daughter they just had to do something so instead of going straight to the police they went to a private security company called vip support systems and basically this agency carries out in 
investigations and operations with the police as well as the Hawks. So VIP support systems received the letters two days after the marshals had found them and as soon as they read these letters they didn't think that it was true they thought that maybe someone was you know maybe like writing a story or someone had taken too many like drugs and they were on something when they had written these letters so because of this they didn't really like it wasn't like top priority for them also they were working on something else they had an operation to run but fortunately that operation had to be delayed so whilst they were just sitting in the office with nothing really to do they decided to look at these letters again and then they were like you know what let's just see if these people actually do exist so they started off with like a simple google search and also searching these names on facebook and it turned out that all these people did actually exist they were actual people so knowing that these people all existed they thought that hmm that's strange and then they started looking more into the letters next they decided to track down the investigating officer that was investigating Temba Shamalala's kidnapping and assault they managed to track him down but at this point he was old he had retired and all the cases that he had been a part of he had kind of like left them behind when he left the police force so he wasn't that much help and as a vip like or as a security company was looking into this investigating officer another officer caught wind of what they were researching and looking into so he decided to also help out and look into them and just like help them look for more evidence to indicate that these letters were true and he came up with the name Carrington Lofton and they immediately thought that maybe Carrington had something to do with the letters and maybe he was the one to have typed out the letter that they had found detailing Betty's murder. Then they decided to search the missing persons database for a Betty Katani. But remember the officer who had typed in Tandiwe Betty Katani's name 13 years earlier had typed her first name and her surname incorrectly. So when they put her name in the missing persons database, nothing turned up. But they, that didn't let them stop them from thinking that, you know, maybe this, like these letters were being truthful. So they decided to go to the marshals to go search for this body. So they got to the marshals and they started digging and they were told that if they found anything, even like close to a person, they had to stop digging immediately and call the police. Because remember, the people that were digging were people part of this security agency and not necessarily the police. So they started digging and almost immediately they found like woolen clothing, but that was it. And then they continued digging and then they saw something that was white and hard. They immediately thought that maybe it was a bird or something like that. So they stopped digging and they called the police. The police got to the marshals, they started digging and then they discovered that this hard white thing that they had found was actually limestone. So they continued digging, they continued digging for almost 10 hours and they found nothing. So they had to call it a day. After this, police involvement was made official. So now the VIP security or investigation company was working with police officers and then they decided to track down the three names that were in the letters, the ones that had been involved in the kidnappings and assaults so Temba Shabalala, Ruth Ngobo and Ndaba Bebe and then they managed to track all three of them down and interview them and their stories were similar to what had been written in the letters they were a bit different here and there also probably because like 13 years had gone by and also because the person writing the letters wasn't them they were just writing like what they saw from like their point of view but because they found these three people and this investigation was true and what had happened to them had actually happened now they believe the letters even more and they were more convinced that someone named Betty Katani had been killed and buried in the marshal's property still with no body they then decided to go to the hospital to see if they had hospital records of someone named Betty Katani who had been hospitalized around the same time with the same injuries but they were two years too late all the documents from 1999 had been destroyed just two years earlier so now they still had to try and find a Betty Kitani and just see if this person actually exists so then they decided to look into credit records so like you know if you have like credit cards or like you open 
a credit like you know like tfg or something like that so they decided to look up a Betty Katani on the system and they found one. They found someone whose name was Tandiwe Betty Katani and it also had an ID number next to it and they discovered that this Tandiwe or like this Betty, you know, still the same person, they discovered that she had diligently been paying off her credit every month until May 1999 when she suddenly just stopped and they tried to get in contact with her but they couldn't reach her and because of this she was eventually grey listed or blacklisted so now that they knew that a Tandiwe Betty Katani existed and they had an ID number they went back to the missing persons database and they put in her identity number and a missing persons report turned up and this is when they discovered that her name and her surname had been spelled incorrectly which is why they weren't able to find her missing persons report. Now that they knew that Betty Katani actually did exist and that she had been reported missing 13 years earlier in 1999 they went back to the marshals to go for a second dig but unfortunately they found nothing again they then decided to go to cranks to go see eric and just question him and at this point cranks was about to close down eric hadn't been paying his rent in rosebank and he owed them about a million rand imagine in rent and they were basically just like taking him to court for not paying. So they went to Eric to just go ask him questions about Tandiwe and Monique. And basically at this point, Eric had gotten married to another Thai woman that he had picked out of a photo album. Literally choosing a wife from a photo album. As soon as they started questioning him, he immediately got really aggressive. He was angry. He wanted no part of it. But then they showed him a letter that they had found at the marshals, the one about a robbery that had taken place. So Eric took this letter, he made a photocopy of it, he read over it, and then he basically told these VIP agents that he like his house had been robbed in a similar manner in 2000 and then he said that the letter like it was a bit different but it was very similar to what had happened to him and that was that so now that police officers had looked into the letters and had found that everything written in the letters had been true like the kidnappings and assaults betty's disappearance in may 1999 and the fact that everyone that had been mentioned in the letters were actual people they then decided to go for the small players in the letters like the people that did play a role but not as big as like monique conway and carrington so they decided to go for dirk reineke first they got Dirk into the police station and they started questioning him and he basically told them that he was present when they did kidnap Tandiwe Ketane but he says that they didn't kill her. He said that they kidnapped her and then after that they put her in a hotel in Sandton and then they released her but they didn't kill her. He said like that was that and then he also said that he was the link between Monique and Carrington and said that he had introduced them and he could confirm that Carrington was carrying out a full-scale investigation into the thefts that were happening at Cranks in 1999. Some of the people who had been written on the letters that they had found could not be like tracked down in South Africa because they had moved abroad. So Monique was currently in Australia as well as a Mark Lister and it turned out that Mark was part of the Queensland police. Then they found out who Saddle was because remember the letter said dear Saddle. They found out that Saddle was actually a Hungarian immigrant. His full name was Saddle Edel. He was friends with Conway and then Conway had introduced him to Carrington and then Carrington and Saddle became really good friends really fast but then he had left South Africa after a couple of years and had settled in New Zealand. They tried to get in contact with him but all their efforts went unanswered and literally that's that like they've never been in contact with Saddle to this day. 
So now that police officers had spoken to the small players, they decided to go for the big players and they managed to track down Conway. I forgot to mention that when they got in contact with Monique, who was in Australia, she immediately lawyered up and she wanted no part of the investigation. She didn't want to help them and nothing. So they really couldn't do much. So now they went for Conway, they found him and they started questioning him and he was very tight-lipped. But after a while, he finally gave them a full confession. According to Conway, he says that in May 1999, he received a phone call from Carrington. And Carrington basically told him to go meet him like, like on some side of the road near Clip River. But he thought that Carrington maybe had like car problems or something like that. So he went and as soon as he got there, Carrington pulled out a woman out of the car and this woman had like a black cloth over her face like she had been covered and then he says that Carrington just pushed this woman onto him onto Conway and then stabbed this woman with a long thin steel like rod in the head and then he got into his car and then he just drove off and he didn't say anything to Conway he didn't tell him what to do with this woman that he had just like left on Conway Conway thought that this woman was dead so he just like left her on the floor and then he drove off which is so crazy because you see someone stab someone in the head and you don't even think oh let me check if she's alive you know maybe let me take her to the hospital let me do something like he just left her on the side of the road and then he just continued on with his life and then he said after a couple of days um, some people arrived at his house so he says that Monique and Dirk arrived at his house in a white van and this was the property that he was renting from the marshals so they arrived in a white van and then they took out the body of a woman and then they decided to bury it on the property so by by Conway's garage and then lay concrete over where this body was buried. He then said five years later in 2004, Carrington called him and told him that they had to move the body. So then in 2004, he, alongside another man whose name was Paul, they had to move the body. So they dug up Betty's body and then they threw her body parts in the municipality like dump sites like you know where they pick up your trash and like all the rubbish goes they basically just dropped off or threw her body there like she was trash and it's just so disgusting but they just threw her body there and then they took the big parts of her body like the skull like you know like the femur bone like the arm bones like the big pieces and then they took a hammer and then they crushed them into small pieces and then threw those into the river and this is why the police couldn't find Tandiwe's body at the marshals because it had been moved in 2004. Conway agreed to help police and he was allowed to go home after this and he was also allowed on a work trip to Italy and we know what happened the last time they allowed someone to go on a work trip abroad but this is not the case Conway did return and police officers did tell him that listen even though you are helping us you should just know that we're not going to help you in any way or like lessen your sentence and Conway said that it was okay and the investigation then continued. So so now that they had a full confession from Conway, it was time to go for the top person of this hierarchy and that was Carrington Lofton. And this was going to prove to be a bit challenging because as I mentioned in the first video, Carrington liked moving around a lot, he didn't like staying in one place. Over the years he had lived in like six different houses, they didn't have a direct address for him but they did try and get one. At this point he was married to his third wife and he had two sons who were both under two. So they managed to get his contact details and get in contact with him and they posed themselves as sponsors. So in 2012 Carrington was running a magazine business, you know, because he chases the money. So running a magazine business, so they called and they were acting as though they were sponsors and that they wanted to meet with him. So they asked for his address, but he was tight-lipped. He literally wouldn't give them, like, wouldn't give them his address. So they tried other ways to get his address, but still... 
Carrington was not falling for it. He was not going to give his address. So then they decided to use Conway. So Conway called Carrington to plan like a meet up and Carrington didn't think anything weird right? didn't, like he didn't find the suspicious or anything like that. He agreed. So on his way to go meet Conway, police found him and this is where they arrested him on suspicion of having illegal drugs. So they used this arrest as a way for them to search his house and then after they searched his house then they finally arrested him on suspicion of murder and kidnapping for Tandiwe Betty Ketane and after they arrested him for murder this is when they took his cell phone as well as his passport. When they went through Carrington's phone, they discovered that he was in a lot of debt. He wasn't this wealthy rich man that he was portraying. He owed people a lot of money. And then also when they talked to him and asked him about Tandiwe's murder and abduction, he said that he played no role in it. And then he said that in May 1999, he was in Cape Town helping the PI branch with the Cape Town International Airport investigation. Do you remember the one that we spoke about in part one? Yeah, he said that he was there at the time and he was nowhere near Joburg. Then after the officers arrested Carrington, then they decided to arrest the five other people that were involved in the case. And these were the Ranger brothers, Paul Nielsen, Dirk Reinecke and Conway. Brown. What police didn't know at the time was that Conway downplayed his role in Tandiwe's abduction and murder. But the truth is we'll probably never really know what happened that fateful night that she lost her life. After they spoke to everyone, it was clear that Monique played a really big role in the kidnappings and assaults into the thefts that were happening at Cranks, but they really couldn't do anything because she was safe and sound in Australia. The case was then given to a prosecutor, and this prosecutor did believe that they had a strong case. They had really they had like a lot of circumstantial evidence, but he wanted physical evidence. So he knew that it wouldn't be possible for them to get a body because Carrington, not Carrington, Conway and Paul had dug up Tandiwe's body and gotten rid of it in the most disgusting way. So now he just, I don't know, like he just wanted more physical evidence. So they decided to go back to the marshals and dig where Tandiwe had been buried. Now they knew exactly where she had been buried, but then they also knew exactly what to look for. So most of the time, if someone decides to move a body that had been buried in one place and had been buried for a long period of time and has been fully decomposed, like just skeletal remains, most of the time, small bones will be left behind. Like the bones in like your fingers or like your feet, they're so small and you know, it's very easy for you to not see them. So they went back to the marshals and they dug where Tandiwe had been buried, hoping to find small pieces of bone that had been left behind when they moved her body and they were lucky. They found three small bones and then they continued digging and then they found three more bones. It turned out that all six of these bones belonged, were like bones that formed part of a foot. So now they had to do DNA tests to confirm that these bones did belong to Tandiwe. But it was going to be a bit challenging because these bones were so small and they didn't want to risk like messing it up basically so they put one piece of bone away for further testing and then like three of the bones they couldn't do dna testing on it so they basically had like two bones to confirm that it was tandiwe and they were fortunate enough and it turned out that the bones did belong to tandiwe betty kitani and finally after so many years her family finally got confirmation that Tandiwe had been killed and they finally knew what had happened to her. The prosecutor wanted one more piece of physical evidence. So remember the letters that the marshals had found? Like 
there were written letters, there was a typed letter, and then there was also a signature at the bottom of the page. So police officers really believed that Carrington had been the one to type the letter as well as write the letters. So they wanted a writing sample from him, but Carrington was not going to give it to them. So they decided to go back a couple of years to find some documents that he had written on, and they found one when he opened his PI business in 1999, and they found his handwriting. Also, they didn't want to use handwriting that he had recently written on because over the years like over time your handwriting changes it doesn't change like significantly but it does change a lot so they wanted something from that period of time and they did find it so they did a writing analysis and it confirmed that Carrington had been the one to write the letters and if I'm not mistaken I think the signature was also his signature so now that they had these two physical like these two physical evidence they were finally able to go to trial and then remember Carrington's second wife Jane there was a time when they were married when Carrington gave her an envelope and basically told her to look after this envelope and just said that it was his insurance policy so after Carrington had been arrested Jane remembered that he had given her this envelope as an insurance policy and that she had just put it in her father's safe and forgotten about it. So she went to the safe, she took out this envelope, she opened it and she saw that there were several pictures inside of it. She said that she only looked at one picture and when she looked at this picture she saw a woman had been handcuffed and this woman had like her back towards the camera and she didn't want to look any further like she don't look at the pictures anymore so she handed over to police and police officers looked over these pictures and as soon as they looked at these pictures they immediately knew that these photos were like fake like it wasn't a real not like it wasn't a real person but like it had been doctored like you know like fake pictures so there was only one picture that had the person's face and the person's face was Ruth Ngobo but they could tell that this face had basically been photoshopped so remember that the letters that the marshals had found um, in one of the letters the person had written that Monique had lied to her father and said that Ruth had been killed but it was a lie and Ruth was actually alive so you know, they think that maybe she, like Monique had faked the pictures to give, or Carrington had faked the pictures to show Eric to like prove to him that Ruth had been killed when she was actually just in hiding. Before the trial started, Paul and Dirk decided to testify for the state, so they became state witnesses. And then the Ranger brothers got no offer because at the time of the crime, they were police officers. And then Conway came to an agreement with the state, so he decided to plead guilty and he accepted two five-year sentences. The first five-year sentence would be suspended, so he would only have to serve the other five-year sentence, but at this point he had already been in prison for one year, and this was because he didn't apply for bail because he thought that he'd be in prison for like the rest of his life, so he didn't see the point in being out for a couple of months, only to be back for the rest of his life. So he had been in prison for one year, and that would mean that he would only have to be in prison for another year, and then he would be able to apply for parole. So basically, he was only going to serve two years for his part in Tandiwe's murder. Two years! Then, finally, on the 17th of February 2014, 15 years after Tandiwe disappeared and was murdered, the trial finally began. Carrington pleaded not guilty and he said that Eric was the one to set him up. So let me quickly tell you about what happened to Eric. Eric the one that owned Cranks. So after all the series of arrests, Cranks closed down but it seemed as though Eric knew that it was bound to happen because a couple of months before Cranks closed down, he had started selling a couple of his properties so that he'd be able to have enough money to immigrate to Thailand. So he had went to the prosecutor, the, the one that was in charge of, you know, Carrington's case to make sure that he goes to prison. He went to this prosecutor and gave this prosecutor a stack of evidence against Carrington and his own daughter Monique and he basically said that he believed that Carrington and Monique had been involved in a series of thefts 
especially like thefts and robberies that he had to deal with does that make sense is my english making sense yeah so basically gave this prosecutor all this evidence that he had against them and he told this prosecutor that he had been trying for years to get carrington to go to prison and he had even bribed police officers to arrest carrington but nothing would work so he was hoping that the prosecutor would finally be able to prosecute Carrington for all the robberies that he had been a part of and because there was no evidence linking Eric to the kidnappings and assaults that had happened to Cranks or Tandiwa's murder he was allowed to go free and then he hopped on a plane and went all the way to Thailand which is probably why we don't have a picture of him. So now back to the trial. It would turn out that Tandiwe wasn't Carrington's first murder. In 1992, seven years before he killed Tandiwe, he had killed another man and he basically claimed that this man had tried to rob him so it was basically just in self-defense but these charges were eventually withdrawn. Then, three years after the trial started, Carrington Lofton was found guilty in the Johannesburg High Court of kidnapping and murdering Tandiwe Betikatane, and he was sentenced to 30 years in prison. The Ranger brothers were found guilty of culpable homicide and kidnapping and were sentenced to four years each. As all of this was happening, the reporters in Australia caught with about the investigation into Tandiwe's abduction and murder as well as the kidnappings and assaults into the workers at Cranks and they discovered that two people who were involved in these two crimes were living in their country and this was Monique and Mark. So after they found this out, they started going after them. Mark wanted no part of it and he decided to resign from the Queensland police. But Monique, she was eating it up. She would do, like she would speak to reporters, you know, go on TV, speak about the case. But every time she did this, she always had her lawyer with her. And then she even told them that if the South African police wanted her help, she was more than willing to like help them with this investigation. But this is the same woman who, as soon as she was contacted, wanted no part of it. So she, she was just lying. The last we heard about what happened to Monique and Mark was that the police were trying to extradite both of them back to South Africa so that they could stand trial for Tandiwe's murder. But there's been no update on that and that was in 2017. After almost two decades of not knowing what happened to their mother, their sister, their daughter, Tandiwe's family went to go fetch her spirit. So like, you know, in black culture, if you pass away somewhere else, it's not like your home, they'll go fetch your spirit just to make sure that your spirit doesn't wander and that she'll be able to just rest peacefully. So they went to the farm in Clip River and then they went to the marshals where Tandiwe had been buried for five years to go fetch her spirit and they were finally able to lay her to rest after what felt like forever. And that's it for today's case. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys enjoyed having a part one and part two. Please let me know your thoughts and opinions. Also, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. It really helps me out a lot more than you know. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye.